Welcome to the First Player Token Podcast, a short podcast for folks who enjoy playing board games with family and friends. I'm your host, Derek Bruff. In this episode, we time travel to the 1960s to compete in the space race between the United States and the Soviet Union in Space Explorer. I'm getting over strep throat, so my voice is a little lower and raspier than usual, but I didn't want to wait any longer to bring this episode to you. I have a bit of a scoop. More on that later. Back in high school, we had some unusual electives. During my junior year, I took a semester of what was called space science. It was really a course on the history of space travel. Having grown up watching the space shuttles take off and land on TV, I was fascinated by the earlier history of space travel. That time back in the 1960s, when the U.S. and the Soviet Union were in a race to put a man on the moon. If you've watched The Right Stuff or Apollo 13 or Hidden Figures, you know what I'm talking about. Those days when humans did what no humans had ever done before, and with technology less sophisticated than today's average smartphone. Space Explorers is a 2017 board game that conjures up the excitement of the 1960s space race. Players take on the roles of heads of space research centers, recruiting a variety of experts to build and launch satellites and spaceships, hoping to have the most impressive set of projects and specialists by the end of the game. You'll need to recruit scientists and engineers, test pilots and astronauts, all illustrated in a style right out of 1960s Life magazines. And those projects you're working on? They're all actual missions, split evenly between the U.S. and the USSR. Sputnik and Voyager, Foscod and Skylab, Lunokhod and Apollo, among others. Each time you play, you select a few missions at random from the 20 in the box. Each mission is worth between 3 and 5 points and requires a different set of specialists in your research and development hub. Let's say 4 engineers and 3 builders and 1 astronaut, or maybe 2 test pilots and 4 scientists. As soon as you add the required set of specialists to your hub, you claim the mission and the points that go with it. If you've played the popular game Splendor, this will sound a little familiar. The basic mechanisms are the same. Recruiting those specialists is the hard part, however, since you're vying for specialists with other players from a common pool. You'll need resources of various kinds to get started recruiting, but once you have a few specialists, it gets easier to recruit more and stronger specialists since talent attracts talent, right? One thing I love about Space Explorers is how it represents both the U.S. and Soviet sides of the space race. Growing up in the U.S., it's easy for me to focus on the U.S. side, but the Russians accomplished some amazing feats during that time, too. Did you know that the Russian Lunokhod was, in 1970, the first remote-controlled rover to move freely about an astronomical object beyond Earth? That's two and a half decades before the U.S. put a rover on Mars. It makes sense that the game would show the Russians well, since it was designed by a couple of Russians, designer Yuri Zaravilov and illustrator Alexei Kott. The game was first published in Russia and brought to the United States in 2018 by U.S.-based publisher 25th Century Games. Recently, I had the opportunity to talk with Chad Elkins, the one-man show that is 25th Century Games. In September 2021, I attended Gen Con, one of the largest board game conventions in the U.S., thanks to a little help from my friend Matt Aiken. Matt is with Keymaster Games, publisher of Parks, You may remember him from episode 7 of the podcast. I worked the Keymaster booth four hours a day and used the rest of my time at Gen Con to check out new games, play games with friends, and record some interviews for the podcast. Chad was at the top of my list because I knew I would be putting together this episode on Space Explorers. Let's head to the convention floor now for my interview with Chad Elkins, publisher of Space Explorers. Tell me who you are and what your connection to 25th Century Games is. Yep, so my name is Chad Elkins. Uh, I'm the founder and owner of 25th Century Games. So I wanted to ask you about Space Explorers, because um, I found this game, I think, at the just at the end of 2019. Okay. Um, and played the heck out of it last year. I really love it. What's the secret origin of, of Space Explorers? Yeah, so Space Explorers is, is very interesting, because um, it's probably not your typical way a small indie publisher ends up with a title Uh, usually it's something that probably more more larger established publishers do which is through a process called uh, localization uh, which is where you take a a game that's being made in another language in another country 
and, and basically convert it into okay. you know, English into whatever whatever language you're localizing it for, uh, and then you distribute it in that language. So we and we we a lot of our titles are done the other way, where we have games that are printed and, and localized in China and, and Italy and Korea, and so early on as a small indie publisher, this was a little bit odd, and the origin was a little bit a little bit unique. Um, I was actually, so I'm, a, I'm a huge space nerd, love space games, uh, obviously the 20th Century logo has a rocket in it, which is kind of connection my, my, I love old sci-fi movies, and like, so that, that was, that's the kind of the origin of why the game's company is called what it is, um, but I was actually just, I was on BGG, just looking, you know, for, for fun space games to try to pick up and buy, just to play, Okay. and I, and I came across Space Explorers, um, and I saw that, it was like, oh, it's in Russian. Okay. I was like, well, if I can get the game, maybe I can find a way to translate it and understand how the, the game plays. So I contacted, um, just to read you, the publisher, uh, and I was like, hey, I was like, can I just buy a copy of this game? And so they're like, yeah, you know, we can send you a copy, but I was like, when we started talking, I'm like, oh, it's not even made in English. I was like, well, what if I just make it in English? It seems like an awesome game. <laughs> and so, um, and we're, we're at Gen Con right now, and probably three years ago, okay. It was, it, we were talking like right before Gen Con, like maybe back a month or so before. And, he's, and, and he was like, hey, I'm going to be at Gen Con. Why don't we just meet there and talk about it and, you know, and just, just work it out? And so I was like, okay. I wasn't even planning to go to Gen Con, but it was like a week before the event. So I literally booked a flight uh, in, a, in a hotel room, like not downtown, like, you know, around the convention center at that point. Uh, and flew in for like one day just to meet meet with him. Um, and you're, you're based around Atlanta. Right? I'm in Atlanta, yeah. Okay. yeah. And so we worked out and printed the game. And it, wow. it was a really great, um, it just worked out really well because one, it's a beautiful game. Uh, the game design, if you like Splendor type yeah. stuff, it's like the next level version of that. That's exactly how I described so, it. It's yeah. Like, yeah, so it's like if, you, if, you get, if you're bored with that game, you want something that's a little thinkier and it's got a lot more things going on, like on every turn, it's like it's so much more intense from a, a, a a strategy standpoint, it's a great game, and it really was. It helped set 25th Century, I think, on on a, a new trajectory, because you know certainly one of our, our best selling games. Um, yeah. It's the first game we got into stores beyond hobby, so it's been in Barnes and Noble for two years. Oh yeah, um, yeah, that's a big deal. And so yeah, so it's, it really kind of el- it helped kind of elevate our brand to a, where people saw it a lot more. Like oh, what's this company? Like I've seen this before. Uh, which has led to other titles having the same kind of uh, drawn attention. But yeah, it, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just it's just a it's a unique weird story that's not your typical right, small indie yeah, publisher yeah. way about getting a game. Yeah. Um, and so actually, so you want some breaking news? So we haven't really yeah. even announced this yet. We'll announce it probably by the time your podcast comes out. Finally, when you're a publisher, <laughs> right. but um, next year we're going to have an expansion for Space oh, Explorers. Oh, that's awesome! Uh, it's called The Age of Ambition. Okay. And uh, I'm so the, excited. Yeah, it's it's so good. <laughs> Uh, Yuri did the design, okay. um, but what's what's cool about it? It's seven different modules, uh, and the modules are like pick and play, right? Okay. Um, if you, like, some of them are a little bit heavier, like, and then others some are really light kind of integrations where it just tweaks the game a little bit. Some tweak it a lot more, um, but we'll uh, you can actually mix and match them into the game. So you, you might play with module one, three, and eight, and, and seven. You might play with like two and one. You might, you just kind of how you want to kind of tweak your game nice. experience. Nice. Uh, you, you you only play with a couple of them, so it's, right. you wouldn't want to put all seven in. Yeah, too but crazy. Uh, yeah, but it's oh, that's great. So it's been great. So so we're actually going to reprint the game because it's currently sold out in our warehouse. So when we do the expansion, we're going to reprint the base game gotcha. obviously as well, uh, and it'll be on Kickstarter next year. That's awesome. I'm very excited about that. What, if anything, did you have to do to kind of localize this game for the U.S. market, other than translate everything in English? Did you make any changes to the, the design or the look of the game? No, so yeah, usually in a localization effort, uh, usually the art stays the same for the most part. Um, usually the game design stays the same. Um, so for this one, it was we, we, we worked on the rule book, obviously, in, in translating right. to English. The game is uh, language independent. So, uh, Sure you're ready. Got it. interruption there. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so the, the, the game itself is largely language independent. It's all icons sure. and stuff. So yeah. the, the cards and things didn't have to change. Uh, we, had to, we had to translate the, the reference guide, of course. That's right. obviously in English. Uh, and then the rule book. Yeah. Uh, and so that, and we, and, we, and we worked on the graphic design of the rule book, too. Um, and kind of 
we worked with them, you know, to like, hey, we, make, we think this is a better thematic change because we, we made the rule book actually look like um, a, a binder, like a three ring binder. Yeah, yeah. With like coffee stains and like, and some tabs. We actually modeled that after actual you know, physical binders from uh, the Apollo era. Oh, wow. Okay. And so we kind of like modeled the rule book. Something you would find in Mission Control. Yeah, we kind of yeah. modeled the rule book after that. That's awesome. Um, and so, and they loved it. I think they're, they're we're using that format. I think for the, even the, the expansion. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Uh, that, that, that's that's pretty much it, though. Yeah, it's a lot, of, lot, lot of work to do all that, but yeah, uh, yeah, you know, I sure. actually tweaked the design because the design is like so tight. It, it, it was absolutely a space race era, and, 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 and having the game really kind of be focused on that that US USSR division uh, really is indicative of that era, uh, and the artwork is very indicative of that era too, right? So it, everything feels like. It feels almost like a life magazine, yeah, you know. Yeah, so yeah. there's, yeah. there's no stark whites in the game. Like it's like right. creams and like the, the color palette that, that the Alexi, the artist, used, that uh, really kind of fits that era. And the the expansion though, we're actually adding um, some other countries. So actually, you've got U.S., Soviet. Uh, I think it's France, uh, China. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So you have a little bit, little bit more country oh, yeah, representation yeah, sure. in there. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, awesome. and, and obviously the art style still feels the same. It'll still, it's still looking, yeah, looking yeah. good. Same game. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Chad, for taking a few minutes here before the booth opens. Absolutely. Thank Appreciate you for your time. Yeah. You heard it here first, folks. An expansion to Space Explorers. Well, maybe you didn't hear it here first. As I record this, Chad made the announcement on social media a few days ago. Regardless, I'm very excited about this expansion. I skipped out on the 2018 Kickstarter, in spite of the beautiful retro art, but I picked the game up on Impulse at a game store in early 2020. I got a lot of plays in before the pandemic, but I haven't played it much lately since it really shines at three or four players, and game nights have been hard to come by. I'll get it back on the table at a game night soon, however, and I'll definitely be backing the expansion when it comes to Kickstarter. I love that the expansion brings in other countries who have been part of the space race. But back to the original game. One element I really like, and that elevates it from similar engine builder games like Splendor, is that every specialist you recruit to your R&D hub has some special ability. But you can only use the ability of the specialist in each division, science, engineering, testing, building, and astronauting, that you most recently recruited. This means that if you recruit a new scientist, it might help you toward claiming one of the missions that everyone is after, but doing so will cover a card ability on another scientist that you might find really useful. I love this twist on engine building and card powers. The final round of Space Explorers is triggered when all the missions are claimed, or when any player recruits 12 specialists to their R&D hub. The big points are in the missions, but you can rack up a lot of points from your specialists, many of which are worth a non-zero amount of points. Having a bunch of low-scoring specialists might help you claim those missions faster, but another player might win the game on specialist points alone. Since you only have slots for 12 specialists before the game is over, you need to make sure each one counts. So deciding whether to go after specialist points, or missions, or card abilities on specialists, that provides lots of interesting choices throughout the game. The game plays quickly, and with the two ways to trigger the end game, it rarely lasts more than an hour. There is a bit of a learning curve with the specialist card abilities in Space Explorers. The iconography is great, but the player aid that explains all the cards is essential reading during the game. And the rules for figuring out how much a new specialist will cost you are a bit wonky. They work well, but I find that most players need a few rounds before they understand how costs work. One quirk of the game is that when you spend resources to recruit a specialist, you don't return those resources to some central pot. You actually pass them to the player on your left. This makes sense thematically. The rulebook says sharing research is vital to progress. But it can make the game a little bit lopsided if the player to your right is hoarding resources. Is Space Explorers a family game? Well, maybe. The basic rules are fairly easy to understand after a few rounds. But understanding all the card powers and using them strategically calls for a slightly older player. I probably wouldn't play it with kids under 10, but if you've done so, I'd love to hear how it went. Can I rave about the art again? It's really eye-catching, with realistic illustrations of the specialists straight out of the 1960s, and dynamic graphics everywhere else in the game. Also, this isn't hidden figures. All the characters are white, but the game does depict women as part of the space race, 
both as scientists and test pilots. I appreciate that bit of inclusion. Finally, I have to add that Space Explorers has one of the best solo modes around. You play against an artificial opponent who runs its own R&D hub and competes with you for missions. It's fairly challenging, forcing you to be very efficient in your actions, as each action you take advances your opponent's work. I love a solo mode that's not just about scoring points, but adapts to your play as you go. That's it for this episode of the First Player Token Podcast. See the show notes for more info and photos of space explorers, as well as a link to the podcast's Facebook group. And stay tuned for future episodes featuring more Gen Con interviews and hopefully a normal voice from me. I've been your host, Derek Bruff. Thanks for listening. Now it's time to play some games. <laughs>